Good evening. We're going to get started now. Uh, I'm Fred Jones, uh, Vice President of the Heartland Land Trust, and uh, we're uh, going to uh, have the program this evening uh, for you. Uh, in our neck of the woods, we often are concerned with really big things, you know, like the bear knocking down our bird feeder, hitting a deer with our car, or even worse yet, a moose falling in your well. It, and that's happened, you know. Um, but uh, there's a little tiny, tiny critter out there that can wreak havoc in a very large way. And we're very fortunate this evening to have an expert amongst us who is going to be able to tell us all about the tick and tick-borne diseases. Dr. Kirby Stafford is a medical veterinarian entomologist whose research focuses on the ecology and control of the black-legged tick. He received his BS in entomology and his MS in veterinarian entomology from Colorado State University and Kansas State University, respectively, and his PhD in med medical veterinarian entomology from Texas A&M University in 1985. After working at Penn State, he joined the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in 1987. Dr. Stafford is currently Vice Director, Chief Entomologist and State Entomologist of the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Kirby Stafford to you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station? Oh, excellent. Because a uh, little bit of distance away here, because our main labs are in New Haven, Connecticut, although we do have our Valley Laboratory there in, in Windsor as well. Um, and we're a state agency. We do a lot of variety of different research. Uh, I hope some of you have taken advantage of some of our plant diagnostic and insect diagnostic services or free soil testing. Uh, we also uh, do the statewide mosquito surveillance program uh, in the state. We track mosquitoes across the state and analyze them for arboviruses, of which uh, eastern equine encephalitis has been getting a lot of news lately, uh, simply because we're just seeing a handful of cases of that because it is a relatively rare disease. But what I'm going to be speaking with you tonight is about ticks. And there's more than just Lyme disease, although obviously that's the, the big elephant in the room. So last year, the CDC uh, issued a report uh, in their Morbidity Mortality Weekly report about how widespread and difficult control diseases from mosquito, tick, and flea bites are a major cause of sickness and death worldwide. The growing number and spread of these diseases pose an increasing risk in the US. The report found that the nation needs to be better prepared to face this public health threat. So, if you go back in time, you'll, find, you'll see that the very first tick-borne disease that was identified in humans was Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And it gets its name from virulent cases that were occurring in settlers, or settlers in the Bitterroot Valley of Montana, even though most cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever actually occur in the eastern United States. And then as what you can see is a sequence across there of a discovery of ever more tick-borne diseases. Tick-borne relapsing fever, tularemia, cholera tick fever, Powassan encephalitis. You may have heard some of, uh, news about that. We're starting to see more cases of that. The first case was a child that died from it uh, in Powassan, Ontario in 1958. Most diseases get their names from where they're initially recognized. So. Powassan virus, Powassan Ontario, Lyme disease, Lyme, uh, Ebola fever there in Africa is actually named after the Ebola River. So that's how a lot of diseases end up getting named is where they're first discovered. And then you'll just see that the discovery accelerated with babesiosis, discovery of Lyme disease in 1982, uh, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, and more recently a lot more, another uh, Borrelia that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia mayoni named after the Mayo Clinic, Borrelia miyamotoi, 
ehrlichiosis, Heartland virus, Pacific Coast fever. We just get, keep discovering all sorts of new tick-borne pathogens and diseases uh, all the time. One that's not on here, which seems to be linked to the Lone Star tick, is a disease called, uh, caused by the Bourbon virus. And it's not named after the drink, it's named after a gentleman that died from the virus in Bourbon County, Kansas. But of course, as you can see here, the total number of disease, uh, tick-borne disease cases in the United States from 2004 to 2017 have steadily been increasing up. Almost 60,000 cases reported in 2017. The CDC here very shortly will be in, uh, uh, issuing the statistics for 2018. But Lyme disease makes up the bulk of that. So here you can see that 68% of all of the vector-borne diseases um, were Lyme disease. Other tick-borne diseases were 27% of the total. Mosquito or flea-borne diseases, only 5% of the total number of cases. And a lot of that has to do, in the case of Lyme disease, is its geographic spread. As the tick has spread, you can see the distribution of cases in 1996 versus that of 2017. And reality is, is only about 10% of the actual physician-diagnosed cases of Lyme disease end up getting reported and tabulated by the CDC. So you're talking around, say, 43,000 cases reported. The true incidence nationally would be around 430,000 cases of Lyme disease in one year. So what we have then is a, sequen a, a collection of about 16 or so human-associated diseases. Um, the ones in blue are the ones that are associated with our black-legged tick or deer tick. And, but we also have a few other ones, which I'll talk uh, briefly about in the course of this evening, uh, such as red meat allergy, uh, ehrlichiosis, tick paralysis, I won't say too much about. Um, but nonetheless, you can see just at our, our deer tick, our black-legged tick, we have anaplasmosis, babesiosis, Lyme disease, Brelia miyamotai, Brelia mayoni, Another form of Ehrlichiosis, Ehrlichias murus, uh, there, and, and of course the Powassan virus. Interestingly enough, the number of Lyme disease cases in Connecticut has been going down. Now we still have thousands of cases, but it's been going down. Now why is really unclear at this point? We still have a lot of ticks out there. I think all of, most of you could probably attest that you don't have any trouble running into ticks, right? Um, but why it's going down is not really clear. Some of it may be reporting fatigue by physicians, uh, but we really don't know uh, at this point. So let's talk about the ticks. There's over uh, about 900 tick uh, species of ticks worldwide, about 10% of major importance, and about 100 species in the U.S., of which about 20 are of major medical or veterinary concern. But here in Connecticut, we have three major species that we're dealing with. We have 16 species of tick that are known in the state, three species that commonly bite humans, and four species that can transmit disease pathogens. Of course, the main one is our black-legged tick, Exodia scapularis. Many of you know it as the deer tick. The American dog tick, Thermocenter variabilis. A few of you sometimes know it as a wood tick. And then we have a new uh, 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 tick coming in here on the stage, Lone Star Tick, Amblyoma Americanum, I'll be talking more about that. And then we have a woodchuck tick, Exodes cookii, which is a vector for Powassan virus. Um, it feeds only occasionally on humans. So let's talk about the black-legged tick. This is the major tick that most of you all are going to run into here in Connecticut. Um, it's, the actual size, you can tell from the illustrations, the, is quite small. Uh, it's a tick that's easy to miss, uh, either while it's on you or attached in feeding. And uh, this tick, and so are all of those that we're dealing with, is a free host tick. So I, this is really important because you need to understand there's three active stages to this tick. You have the larva, the nymph, 
and the adult. And each stage requires a blood meal before it goes to the next stage, or in the case of the female tick, lays eggs. So let's start with this cycle. Unfortunately, I don't really have a pointer on this thing. But, okay. So the female tick you see here will lay about 1,000 to 2,000 eggs. Then the larval ticks will hatch from those eggs, and they're not infected. Okay? So the Lyme disease bacteria are not transmitted by the female tick to her progeny. Those larval ticks become infected when they feed on an infected mouse, chipmunk, shrew, or a few species of birds. So the larval tick feeds mainly on the rodents and birds, but again, it'll feed on us too. It's not picky about where its blood meal comes from. After that larval tick feeds, it drops off and molts to the second stage, a nymph tick. Again, the nymphs feed mainly on rodents and birds, but they feed readily on us. After it engorges, it drops off and becomes an adult tick, male or female, and the adult ticks feed on medium to larger animals. They're not feeding on the mice. So dogs, cats, coyotes, foxes, us, but mainly white-tailed deer. And again, like I said, then the female feeds, she drops off and lays about 2,000 eggs. So if you look at the illustration here, black-legged tick, about 1,000 to 2,000 eggs, a lone star tick, anywhere from 1,000 to 8,000 eggs, an average around 3,000. You can see the picture of lone star ticks on that deer there. And if you look at this illustration on uh, here, you'll see a female tick, and then right there is a larval uh, hatching from the egg mass. The female tick dies after she lays the eggs. One single clump of eggs. So if you pick that spot to have your picnic, you can end up with a lot of larval ticks on you. And as I said, they feed a lot mainly on rodents and birds. If you look at the white-footed mouse right there at the ears, you'll see the engorged larval ticks feeding on it. Now, if this mouse is infected with the Lyme bacteria, it can infect the ticks that are feeding on it. Indeed, that's how it's maintained in the wild. Simplistically, the ticks will infect a new generation of mice. The mice will then be available to infect a new generation of ticks, and that it just cycles. That's basically how it's, it's maintained, the Lyme disease is maintained in the wild. But you can also see they feed quite heavily on birds. So this very, if you look carefully around the eye, you'll see the uh, black-legged ticks feeding on that uh, bird as well. There's a definite seasonal activity to each stage of the tick here in the Northeast. So the, that female tick generally lays her eggs in May. And the larval ticks will hatch from those eggs around sometime around mid-July or so. So August is the peak month, and shown in blue, of larval tick activity. Those larvae will feed, drop off, become nymphs, and those nymphs actually go through the winter and show up the following year as nymphs. So the nymphal stage becomes active in mid-May. June and July is the peak month for nymphal tick activity. Uh, and then once those nymphs feed, they drop off, molt to adults. The adults show up in the fall. They do not hibernate. They will be active on warm days in the spring, and then you'll see some additional activity when things warm up in the spring as well. So right now, we're getting ready here shortly to see adult black-legged ticks coming out. What were they this summer? Nymphs. Okay. What were they the year before that? Larvae. It takes two years to go through that whole life cycle. Now, if you oh, uh, over put, uh, put the seasonal activity and overlay it over Lyme disease month of onset, you'll see that the peak months for a Lyme disease occur in June, July, and, and trailing off into August, right when the nymphal ticks are active. Probably somewhere around, oh, I don't know, 70% of all Lyme disease cases occur in the summer. Why? You're outside. Got shorts, you're hiking, camping, working around your yard. Um, the nymphal tick is very small, the bite is painless, it's easy to miss. So that, but you can get it almost any time of the year. So what is your actual risk? 
It turns out that this was a, uh, a survey that was done by the Stanford Health Department for ticks that were being submitted to the experiment station for testing. We do test ticks for free from the public for Lyme disease, babesiosis, and anaplasmosis. So, and you'll see here what were you doing when you were out, uh, pick, you think you were doing when you picked up the tick. 74% said outdoors at home, 21% said in activities away from the home. So in general, we consider Lyme disease to be largely a paramistic risk. You're picking up, most people are just picking up the tick in activities right around the home. What were those activities? If you look at what people think they were doing when they picked up the tick, play outdoors, 47% of the submitted ticks were coming from children. What were the other highest risk activities? Gardening, yard work. Makes sense, right? It's quite a contrast because Lyme disease out in California is caused by the western black-legged tick and exposure out there is largely recreational. A little different scenario or story out there. If you look at the age distribution for Lyme disease, here in Connecticut there's been kind of a shift up into the older years, but if you look at the national CDC statistics from 2001 to 2017, what's the highest risk case or the highest number of cases? In children. The lowest is in people in their 20s. Why? What are the 20 year olds doing? Going to college. Playing with their computers. Playing with their computers, Game Boy, PlayStation, the mall, I don't know. Well, whatever it is, it's not outdoors, right? So you'll see there through the 30s and 40s, the risk increases, and then when you get older, the, the risk goes down, which corresponds with, with that earlier slide showing where play was a high risk activity, gardening, yard work, things like that was a high risk activity. Okay? So that was just a quick life, uh, br uh, review of the life cycle of the black-legged tick. Another tick I want to mention is the Lone Star Tick. Now this tick is responsible for over 90% of the tick bites in the southeastern United States. So if you go on vacation down somewhere in the southeast, this is the tick you're most likely to run into. Okay? And it has its own suite of diseases, mainly Ehrlichiosis. Ehrlichia chaffiensis is the main pathogen that's transmitted by the Lone Star Tick, but some others, Heartland virus, Bourbon virus, um, Tularemia perhaps, but the one that's really starting to get a lot of people's attention is red meat allergy. This tick has been linked with a uh, delayed hypersensitivity uh, reaction or allergic reaction to red meat, and this is caused by, the actual mechanism is kind of unclear, but basically you get exposed to the sugar called alpha-gal for short. The sugar does not occur in primates. We don't have it, but it occurs on all other mammals. So when you get unnaturally exposed to the sugar through a tick bite, you can develop an allergic reaction to it, which can range anywhere from gut upset to hives to full anaphylactic shock. And it may mean you'll never eat a hamburger again. So that tends to get a lot of people's attention. So the issue is this tick has been moving north. So in 1946, there were no Lone Star ticks on Long Island. In the early 1990s, it started showing up. This tick is quite abundant on the eastern end of Long Island. Okay. And we're also starting to see more of it here in Connecticut. So these are the number of Lone Star Tick submissions to the Connecticut Agricultural Experimentation's Tick Testing Lab. And that increase is not real large, but it is significant. And most of the ticks, Lone Star Ticks we're receiving are coming, at least for the moment, from uh, Fairfield and New Haven counties. But you can see we have records from uh, over much of the state. So interestingly enough, in 19, 2007, I mean, uh, there was a report of a dead or dying deer on Manresa Island in South Norwalk, Connecticut. So a DEEP conservation officer went to check it out. And he found this young buck dead, just covered with ticks. And you can see the ticks all around the eye of this poor animal and so on. So the photograph was sent to me. I met him the next day. 
uh, and I found this deer, uh, deer had was just covered with Lone Star ticks. So we had this population, heavy, early heavy population of Lone Star ticks here on this little peninsula down in South Norwalk. This area is not open to the public, but it really isn't that too surprising considering how abundant it is on, on parts of Long Island, but it's making inroads, inroads here into uh, Connecticut. And we're starting to see more and more of this as well. So exotic ticks, of course, Lone Star tick is somewhat exotic to us, but we also see a lot of exotic ticks coming from elsewhere in the world here into the U.S. So non-native and invasive tick species also pose a great threat to human and animal health. Ticks come in on people. I've had ticks submitted to me from people that have come back from Africa on safari, things like that. Um, on livestock, wildlife, animal products, and the commercial pet trade. Uh, and some of these tick species, are, you know, they do feed on humans, and some of them are vectors for human diseases, and some of them also pose a real severe threat to our livestock industry as well. So that was kind of surprising, because in also in 2017, New Jersey announced the discovery of an East Asian tick known as the longhorn tick, Haemophysalis longicornis, on a heavily infested sheep in Hunterton County, New Jersey. The sheep had no history of travel. Uh, this, so this uh, tick uh, is a serious pest to livestock. In cattle, horses, sheep, and goats, it will attack humans. Uh, it's a known vector for a number of human and animal pathogens, and it's detected now in at least 12 states and is abundant in localities throughout those states. There was just a recent report of some cattle that were killed by this tick down in the Carolinas. Now, some interesting things about this tick. First of all, its native range is Japan, the Korea, uh, uh, Northeast China, things like that. Uh, there it is a human pest. It transmits a disease in Korea called severe fever with hemo, uh, uh, cytopenia syndrome. It's uh, you know, kind of a nasty hemorrhagic virus. Uh, fortunately, none of the ticks here have tested positive for anything that we've looked for. But, um, but it got introduced into Australia in the late 1800s. It got introduced into New Zealand in the early 1900s. There, it's basically really a cattle pest. It's a real severe livestock issue. Um, so here, uh, and you can see in this graph here, uh, it's been found in scattered uh, states all through the eastern uh, and Atlantic seaboard. Um, and we expect its potential range to expand from there. Uh, here, it's, been, it's quite abundant in parts of Westchester County. It's extremely abundant on parts of Staten Island. It's been found on uh, Fire Island. Um, so that's where it's creeping up here in our direction. Um, we've only had three detections so far here in Connecticut. And both, uh, all of them were down in Fairfield County. Maybe not too surprising given the fact it's really abundant right next door in New York. So um, it remains to be seen uh, what the significance uh, of this tick will be other than a major livestock pest. It likes dogs too. So uh, we'll just kind of see how, how this continues to develop. But apparently it's going to be a real issue for some livestock producers. It actually doesn't tend to like humans all that much, although we do have records of it feeding on humans. Uh, but the other unique thing about this tick is it is it reproduces parthenogenically. No males required. So all it takes is one female tick to start a really massive new population uh, with this tick. Okay. All right, so that's kind of a quick run through of ticks and tick biology. So let's talk about what we can do to reduce our risk of getting bitten by a tick and exposure to tick associated diseases. Okay, so education, behavior change, I kind of little, we're a little bit talking about tonight, personal protection measures, landscape modifications, chemical control, and that can either use synthetic insecticides, a lot of interest is obviously in botanicals or so-called natural products, I'll talk briefly about that, but I will stay up front, most of them do not, do not work very well. Uh, biological control, host reduction or exclusion, host-targeted acaricides, and host-targeted vaccines. 
Okay, personal protection measures. Okay, that's your first line of defense. You know, if you're out there in tick territory wearing long pants and tucking them in your socks, is really important. How many of you do that? Yay, I'm not the only person holding, holding up my hand. Uh, remember, most ticks are down in that lower vegetation, okay? And they're acquired on the lower extremity. You'd be surprised at how fast they can actually move. And so they just crawl up, okay? So that's your first line defense. Then using either a skin-based repellent, such as DEET or picaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus, or using a permethrin-based clothing tick repellent, uh, either comes in a spray, you can spray your clothes. There are some companies that sell pre-treated, you know, permethrin pre-treated clothing that you can purchase as well. And then, of course, bathing and doing tick checks when you come back in. The illustration right here is an engorged, nymphal, black-legged tick with a common straight pen for size comparison. So even engorged, it's still pretty small okay, and easy to miss. Because remember, these ticks do not fly, they do not jump, and they don't drop from the trees. Okay, so the larvae and immatures are feeding mainly on what? Mice and chipmunks and ground foraging birds. Okay, the adult ticks, their preferred host is white tailed deer. How big are white tailed deer? Okay, so they will get into the shrub layer, but they're not way up in the tree. They actually desiccate fairly easily. They, they need that humidity that you find in ground cover and the leaf litter on the forest floor. And so they'll come up questing, you know, in that little lower vegetation tips of the grass, but they're losing body moisture and they have to go back down under that leaf litter and recover their body moisture if they get too dried out. So they're actually moving up and down in the vegetation. Um, and then when they do, what they're doing is they're holding on, say, to the uh, grass like you see here and they have their legs outstretched, they can detect the CO2 in your breath, body heat, vibration, and so forth, and they just will grab a hold when you pass by, okay? Now, Lone Star ticks are a little different. They'll do the same thing, but they'll also come after you. So, black-legged ticks are what we call ambush strategists. They will just kind of hope you come by. They'll detect you, but they'll just sit there and wait. Lone Star ticks will be waiting and a uh, meal, and they'll start walking towards you, okay? I've heard stories of people on Long Island that can't get from their front door to the car parked in the driveway without being attacked by a number of Lone Star ticks. So, anyway. When you come back in, wash your skin if you treated it with a skin-based repellent like DEET. Wash your clothes to remove any repellent. You can wash your permethrin treated clothing before you do another application, but one application will last about two weeks, okay? They will survive a wash, but they will not survive a dryer. 15 minutes to an hour in a hot dryer will kill them. The ticks do not survive in the house. The only tick that really builds up numbers inside is the brown dog tick, sometimes known as the kennel tick. Okay, so your houses are typically too dry for the tick to survive more than a day or two, unless it's sitting in a moist laundry basket or something like that, okay? So if you look at the ticks that have been received by the experiment station for testing, you, again, you'll see that nearly 80% in 2017 were the black-legged tick. About almost 2% were Lone Star ticks, still a small percentage, but like I said, that number's been steadily increasing. 18% were uh, American dog ticks, and we had three Exodes cookii, that woodchuck tick, and one hyaloma truncatum, which is an exotic tick you find in Africa. So, um, yeah, so those are the tick submissions to the station. Here's the testing results. What's your risk of actually encountering an infected tick? You'll see out of the number, thousands of ticks that are tested every year, about half, roughly, are uninfected. So you basically, you have about a 50-50 chance that any one particular tick is not infected, on average, okay? About 30%, and again, this is nymphs and adults, it tends to be a little higher in the adults, lower in the nymphs. So you may be talking 20 
to 30 percent in the nymphal ticks, 40 to 50 percent in the adults, the average is around 30 percent. So they are uh, uh, infected with Brelia brigdorferi, which is the agent that causes Lyme disease, Babesia microti that causes human babesiosis, you're talking somewhere between 6 and 11 percent. Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which causes anaplasmosis, is a roughly uh, running around probably 5 percent. And then you'll see much lower uh, rates of co-infection. So you can actually get more than one tick-associated disease from a single tick bite, although in most cases it's probably more than one tick that got you. So here at the bottom, you'll see Borrelia, Babesia, and Anaplasma by 0.2, 0.4% uh, of the ticks had all three of these particular pathogens in it. So if that was your tick, you just won the tick lottery. Okay. So anyway, so let's talk about how a tick feeds. A tick's not like a mosquito. It doesn't, you know, which has hypodermic mouth parts, goes into a capillary. Two minutes later, it's done feeding and it's gone. Ticks feed for days. So a nymphal black-legged tick requires four days for full engorgement. A female black-legged tick requires five to seven days for full engorgement before they drop off, withdraw their mouth parts and drop off on their own. Okay? So they have to set their mouth parts. So what you'll see in the upper illustration is the mouth parts of a nymphal tick. This is a scanning electron micrograph of a female black-legged tick. You can see the label palps, or sensory and function there on the head of the tick. And the actual part that enters the skin is like a three-pronged structure. So what you have are the ch tooth, the chelicery here with teeth on it, and then this hypostome with all these little recurved teeth on it is like a lower lip. So it's a three-pronged structure. And the tick uses the, the blades on the chelicery to actually cut into the skin. So as the tick starts to feed, it cuts into the skin, and then it begins to secrete, most ticks, a cement-like material around the mouth parts, which helps it hold on. Dog ticks, for example, have very short <coughs> mouth parts as big as they are. It really doesn't penetrate that far in the skin, but it secretes a lot of that cement, which is what helped makes them so hard to pull off. Then the tick begins secreting a lot of pharmacologically active materials like vasodilators, anticoagulants, immune suppressive compounds, proteases. It creates this microscopic little lesion under the skin that the blood pools into. So the tick is spitting and sucking and spitting and sucking throughout that full days of feeding. And most of the blood meals take in the last day of feeding, which one entomologist described as the grand slurp, before it drops off. Now, the spirochetes, or the bacteria that cause Lyme disease, are in the tick gut, which is in the colorful little squigglies that you see on my graph here. When the tick begins to feed, the Lyme bacteria begin to multiply. And then they actually have to penetrate the gut wall, migrate through the body of the tick to the salivary glands before they're injected in in the feeding process. That's why the transmission takes time. So you want to remove the tick as promptly as you can. And again, you can see the nymph and a female in my hand for a size comparison here. And I like using fine tip forceps. Now, there's a number of tick removal devices on the market. Some work, some don't. Uh, a lot of them are designed for like a fully engorged dog tick rather than that little itty bitty little nymphal tick. Um, but nonetheless, I prefer jeweler forceps where you can come into the side and just pull a tick right out. And then if you look here on this graph, here's your risk of transmission, OK? So at 24 hours, it's 0%, even if the tick is infected. And then as the spirochetes arrive in the salivary glands, the odds go up. So by 48 hours, it's around 12%, 72 hours, 75%, and almost 100% when the tick is fully engorged. This is assuming the tick's infected to begin with. This 24-hour threshold sort of loosely also applies to babesiosis and anaplasmosis as well, but for other reasons. Okay? The exception to this is the Powassan virus, which can be transmitted within 15 or 30 minutes as after a tick attachment. But those tick checks are important. 
So let's just quickly go through the diseases. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of depth, uh, but early infection uh, with Borrelia burgdorferi is characterized by a distinctive expanding red rash in maybe 70 to 80 percent of infected individuals. Not everyone gets the rash. It can also be missed. If you're single and it's on your back, you may not even notice it. Okay? Because it usually has very little sensation to it, maybe warm to the touch. If you don't do anything, it'll expand and it'll resolve or disappear in about four weeks. It appears generally around seven to nine days after the, at the site of the tick bite, and it can actually get as big as a dinner plate. Um, it may clear in the center, the so-called classic ear bullseye rash, bullseye rash. Only about 15% of the rashes will actually take on that characteristic true bullseye looking appearance, okay? And then at the same time, you'll have those little pain, things like joint pain, fatigue, headache, stiff neck, you know, those little kind of viral kind of associated symptoms with it. You just don't feel very good. And then what happens is that rash is actually caused by the bacteria migrating right there in the skin at the site of the tick bite. You can actually do a biopsy and recover the spirochetes. Then it goes into the blood system, but it's there for a very short time as it disseminates to uh, your skin, uh, muscles, I mean, not the muscles, excuse me, your nervous tissue, joint tissue, things like that. About 15% of people will have multiple rashes separate from the initial site of the tick bite. And they tend sometimes to be not quite as distinct as the original rash. And then as it gets into here, this dissemination stage, you'll have fatigue, muscle and joint pain, maybe chills and fever, headache, and so on. Late Lyme disease is characterized within weeks or months, generally by arthritis, roughly in 30 to 60 percent of people. Generally, it's your large joints, especially the knees. About 10 percent of people will develop neurologic Lyme symptoms. Bell's palsy is an early one, most common. That's paralysis of your facial muscles on one side. As it gets into your nerves, you'll end up with headaches, stiff neck, tingling or numbness in your extremities gets in your nervous system. Some people have forget, uh, forgetfulness, changes in memory, mood, or sleep, and cognitive impairment. About 5% or so, 8% will have heart block. The few cases of Lyme disease deaths are associated with this particular manifestation, okay? Uh, with the atrioventricular block. Uh, and about 10 to 20% of people don't tend to respond to treatment and continue to have problems. And I'm not going to get into the whole controversy about, you know, chronic Lyme versus post-Lyme syndrome, uh, which still really isn't totally resolved. There's evidence for both. So basically, chronic Lyme means you have persistent infection by the spirochete, so therefore you might want to treat with continued antibiotics. Post-Lyme syndrome is a syndrome manifestation as a result of infection, which may be immune-related. You don't have active infection anymore, so antibiotics aren't going to do you any good. And that still hasn't really been fully resolved. And it may be something that really varies from case to case. But again, the important thing is, is early diagnosis and treatment. Most people, if you get diagnosed and get treated right away, that's the end of it. Okay? And then you can get another tick bite and get it again. The antibodies that are produced in infection will, uh, will actually probably wipe out a lot of the bacteria in you, but it doesn't eliminate them all, and it's not protective. So, so serologic testing has been quite controversial. It's, it's um, fairly specific, but not very sensitive. So what happens is you generally it's a two-tiered test where you use an enzyme-linked immunoassay, um, or an ELISA test, that's a sensitive test. If it's negative, there's no more testing. If it's positive, then they do a Western blot. Uh, now the FDA has approved doing a separate ELISA uh, as well for the second stage of it. The biggest issue with serologic testing is it's testing your antibody response. And that will vary somewhat by individuals. Now most people in acute, any infection are gonna have antibodies detected by a test but it takes four to six weeks for your body to produce enough antibodies to be detected by the test. So one of the biggest fallacies with serologic testing is it's giving too soon in that window before you have antibodies that can be detected by the test. So if you have the rash and you feel like hell, okay, 
you'll still be negative if you do a blood test. That should be a clinical diagnosis. And the physician may follow up with what they call a seroconversion test, see later whether you seroconvert uh, later. But um, so again, so it takes several weeks for the antibodies to show up that are detected in the test. And sensitivity is high for disseminated disease. But again, like I said, it relies on your immune response. Okay. Babesiosis. This is a little different. This is a protozoan organism. Okay. It's similar to having malaria. This organism attacks your red blood cells. Uh, it's carried by the mice, picked up by the tick, and transmitted to us through the tick bite. It takes about one to nine weeks before symptoms appear after a tick bite, which is flu-like symptoms, fevers, chills, sweats, body aches, loss of fatigue, uh, nausea, things like that. The interesting thing about Babesia is symptoms in individual range from subclinical, you don't even know you're sick, to you're dead. That's quite a range, isn't it? So the fulminating disease ranges depends on your age. So the older you are, the more at risk you are for severe disease symptoms with this. If you're immune suppressed for some con uh, reason, let's say you're on chemotherapy or whatever, uh, that would put you at high risk. And if you don't have a spleen, so if you've ever had your spleen removed, you're extremely high risk of virulent Babesia infection because your spleen removes infected red blood cells. So we don't know what the true incidence of babesiosis is. There have been transfusion cases in donated blood. Uh, some, some fatalities with babesiosis with younger people, and I'm talking about that, I'm saying their 50s as opposed to 60s, 70s or so, have been associated with transfusion cases. Okay. Anaplasmosis is, another, is a bacterial agent caused by anaplasmic phagocytophilum that attacks a certain type of white blood cell called a granulocyte. Um, symptoms include fever, muscle uh, pain, severe headache, and so on. Um, the trick with this is, is uh, trying to get a proper diagnosis because there's no rash, there's no overt distinct symptom that would clue you in that that's what you've got. But what you would find in a blood test is a lower white cell count and a lower platelet count. So if that shows up on your blood work workup, that would be a suspicion that maybe you have anaplasmosis. It responds extremely fast to treatment with doxycycline. I mean, you bounce right back. But the trick is just getting a correct diagnosis. Ehrlichiosis is very closely related to anaplasmosis. It's transmitted by the Lone Star Tick. Again, symptoms can be mild, severe, and require hospitalization. You're talking things like fever, muscle and joint pain, shaking, chills, and sweats. Clinical illness is greatest in older immunocompromised patients. And again, the doxycycline, te uh, tetracycline gives really rapid uh, response uh, in the treatment. Some people will, retire, uh, will recover without treatment. All right, so that's just a quick overview of the three major diseases that we're dealing with here in Connecticut. I don't have time to go into all the others. But let's talk about landscape invasive plants and ticks. So most ticks, as I mentioned earlier, require high humidity for survival. They're under that leaf litter, they're under ground cover, things like that, and then move up in the vegetation. And then, of course, also our stone walls. As a little side note, you may not have realized, you realize New England has 240,000 miles of stone walls, and they're all mouse hotels, okay? So we got a lot of great habitat here, folks. So actually, uh, the way we sample ticks is basically a real high-tech method called a tick drag. I use polar fleece. It's just a square yard fastened to a wooden dowel. It's dragged along the vegetation. The ticks will attach to it just like they would you or your pet or things like that. Quite simple. We do, you know, do specified transects and plots and things like that, but that's how we do it, okay? Uh, we can also live trap mice and take the ticks off of them and take blood samples to see how many are infected and then release them. But I think it's kind of interesting that popular science in November 2004 said tick collecting was one of the worst jobs in science. <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad. It's kind of fun, actually. 
But what we found with a lot of collecting is, particularly in residences, that if you look at the lawn, I recovered 82% of the ticks within three meters or about three yards of the edge of the lawn with the stone walls, the forest edge, or ornamental plant, uh, plantings. 18% were further than that, but again, there's a higher edge risk effect. But I've collected ticks and pack of sand or next to a garden hose right outside the front doorstep. So you don't necessarily have to go into the woods to pick up, pick up a tick, okay? So you think, when you think about your landscape management, you think about your yard as the tick zone. That's your woods and high risk areas. And then you wanna create an area where it's a tick safe or safer zone. So in the upper illustration there, you'll see a property where things were really cleaned up. You know, a lot of, you know, just unmaintained, the swing set there in the woods, uh, put in a wood chip barrier, open things up to more sunlight, and the number of ticks, they're still there, but the number of ticks in the woods moving into the yard was reduced by about 90% in this case. Okay, wood chip barriers, that's what we used in the study because that's what we could afford to use, but it decreased the number of ticks moving into the yard by roughly half. Okay. And then swing sets. Where do most people put the children's swing sets? In the woods. Right in what I call the tick zone. So, I mean, I understand why. It's, it's hot in the summer, but this is really more of what you should be doing if you want to minimize or reduce children's exposure to ticks, okay? Now, another aspect is, is that invasive plants make great tick habitat. How many of you have barberry behind your house? Great tick habitat. I'm not talking about a single ornamental barberry. I'm talking about stands of barberry, okay? So we found a lot higher tick counts with invasive uh, plant forest understory, the native forest understory, and then Japanese barberry in particular, which is an invasive and a, particularly a real concern for forest regeneration and other issues. But um, there's a lot more ticks in there. And removal of the Japanese barberry will significantly reduce the number of infected ticks in those areas where the barberry has been removed. Similarly, honeysuckle, same thing, removal of that particular invasive plant. Um, decreased deer activity and the numbers of Ehrlichia infected Lone Star ticks. So invasive vegetation in many cases provides just simply great habitat and the ticks do very well in it. Okay? So uh, another reproach for trying to manage your tick numbers is just to get rid of that Japanese barberry. Of course uh, it has other benefits too in terms of our forests and uh, wildlife. Spraying is still the mainstay, at least for individual uh, people to control ticks on their property. This can range from using something like carbamate, like seven, uh, pyrethroids, uh, insecticides are the major ones that are used today. And then I'll talk about biopesticides um, that have uh, been used. But as you can see in these, all these studies that have been done, the pyrethroids and so forth, reduction of nymphs, you're still, yeah, there's a bit of a range there, but you're still talking pretty high levels of control with the application of these ornamental turf insecticides, okay? I will point out that the interest in more natural compounds, there was um, eco-PCO was one that did work fairly well, it's pyrethrum, uh, natural pyrethrum, thyme oil, and so on, uh, cedar oil, much less. There's a lot of companies that are producing cedar oil products. The limited testing that's been done so far hasn't found it working all that great. Okay, so two of the cedar oil products only got five to six percent knockdown of the ticks uh, in a study that was done at the University of Rhode Island. A colleague of mine on Long Island that tested a third cedar product has been getting about 31 to 40 percent knockdown uh, with it. Uh, better, but still not all of that uh, terrific. So I spent quite a few years working with this approach. Okay, this is MET-52 bioinsecticide. It's the fungus Metarhizium anisophile, strain 52. This is an entomopathogenic fungi. These are fungi that attack insects and some related arthropods. Okay, they occur naturally. There's a number of different ones, but they occur naturally in the soil. Uh, and natural infection rates tend to be fairly low. How many of you use BT? Do you know what that is, Bacillus thuringiensis, for controlling caterpillars and things like that? It's also used for gypsy moth. 
Same concept, okay? That's a biological agent. So is this. So I did a lot of trials with this, uh, which eventually led to it being registered by the EPA and the company manufacturing this under the label MET52. There is a female black-legged tick killed by the fungus. It is sprayed just like a traditional pesticide, which is why the EPA calls it a biopesticide. And again, you're not gonna get quite the level of control that you get with a synthetic chemical, but it is an alternative that you could use as well. We're using it in our trials. So some of the issues with so-called natural products is, is that a lot of them have limited efficacy. They're exempted from testing. Uh, you have variable and unknown composition of some of these essential oils, depending on the source, plant species, how it's extracted, and so on. They're extremely volatile. So the very few that have been found to have any kind of efficacy, you spray it, and it's gone within a few days. There's no residual. Okay? And then you have the efficacy of the essential plant essential oil versus specific components. So nucatone is a specific component of the essential oil of Alaska yellow cedar. You can also get it from grapefruit. It's a very effective repellent and it kills ticks. So that particular component is quite effective. I've spent several years field testing this uh, and my colleagues in New Jersey as well. Um, and there is a company that's in the process of making a product with Nucatone called Nucashield, and it's under EPA review as well. So that's one product that has a lot of promise, uh, but most don't work. I see two down here in the last bullet, the second to last bullet was a, pro a rosemary oil product that actually worked fairly good in controlling nymphal black-legged ticks for at least two weeks in main studies or more, but that product is no longer available. And they actually upgraded it, upgraded it, called it IC3, uh, Ecentra, and it's only, that's only about 30% effective. So formulation of these natural products really seems to be key in terms of how well they work, but it's hard to keep up with that. Host targeted control is another approach that we've been looking at in terms of targeting the white-footed mice, chipmunks, as well as white-tailed deer. So remember, the mouse is the reservoir host and host for immature stages. So remember, ticks become infected by feeding on a mouse if it's infected. Okay. Deer are not reservoir hosts. Deer actually eliminate the infection. They do not infect ticks. So you'll hear the story about, oh, it's the mice. No, it's the deer. No, it's the mice. Actually, it's both. They each have their role to play. Deer is the main reproductive host. Ticks that feed on deer do not become infected, so they can actually dilute how many are infected, but it's often more than compensated by the number of ticks that they actually contribute. Okay? So the rodent reservoirs then, chipmunks and mice, uh, the two approaches are the tick tubes, which is permethrin treated cotton balls. The idea is the mice collect the cotton, take it back to their nest to kill the ticks on it. Chipmunks don't collect that. And then you have this fipronil-based uh, bait box, which is a, uh, has a non-toxic food block, a wick with fipronil. You know, fipronil is the active ingredient in the front line for flea and tick control on dogs and cats. One application of the mouse, that mouse will kill any ticks it picks up for up to 30 days. So the idea behind that then is basically your mouse is going around and killing ticks rather than infecting ticks. Okay. The approaches with deer have involved exclusion. So I did a big study with a seven strand high tense electric deer fence and a couple of properties in Lyme, Connecticut, found that it made a huge difference. 84% fewer uh, uh, nymphs, no larval ticks, and 74% fewer adults, simply because they were fenced out of an area of acres, okay? Reduction of deer has been a, an approach that's been taken in the last is treatment. This device is called a four poster. It was developed by the USDA in Texas for a different tick issue. It holds corn, it goes into this little trough, and the rollers are treated with permethrin. So it's a passive topical treatment of the deer. The deer come in and then they get treated and it kills any ticks that are on the deer. Okay. So here is a study that was done by my colleagues in New Jersey where they compared the tick tube with the bait box. So you can see that the tick tube resulted alone 27 to 20% 20, 20 control of the nymphs 
within one to two years. The bait boxes resulted in 84 to 79% control within the uh, first and then second year. And, but there's a big, so it was more effective, but there's a cost differential. You're talking a little over $3 for a tick tube, you're talking $45, including installation for a bait box. Uh, deer reduction. Uh, one of the studies that I was involved in was on uh, Mumford Cove, Connecticut in Groton. It's a self-taxing uh, district shown the arrow there next to the Bluff Point Coastal Preserve. Residents there got tired of the deer and they got tired of the ticks. So the uh, DEEP, working with them, uh, initiated a series of controlled hunts. And as you can see in this graph here, you can see deer density in the dotted line. The hunt began or was implemented in November of 2000. Given the two-year life cycle, you'll see the lag in the number of nymphal ticks decline quite substantially. In the second graph, again, you'll see the deer density in the dotted line, and you'll see the number of Lyme disease cases in the community in the solid line, which drop right along with the number of ticks and the number of deer. So deer were reduced down from 122 to 13 deer per square mile. There was a 76% reduction in tick abundance and 80% reduction in resident reported cases of Lyme disease. Okay. May not a solution for everywhere, but nonetheless, you have to get deer down to that very low level around 10 to 13 deer per square mile. Monhegan Island off of Maine, where deer were introduced for hunting purposes in 1955, the residents there finally decided they'd had enough. They brought in a sharpshooter. They eliminated all the deer on the island, and guess what? No more ticks, okay? Except for occasional tick that comes in on a migrating bird. Okay. So what we've been doing lately is some integrated studies. This was a study in Redding, Connecticut, where we had neighborhoods that served as controls. We had one area where we were gonna actually try removing deer just in those neighborhoods. We had uh, a neighborhood where we were using that MET-52, that fungus, in the bait box, and then a neighborhood where we all combined all three, deer removal, the MET-52, and the bait box. We didn't re uh, achieve our deer reduction targets, but you can see that the combination of the bait box and MET-52 significantly reduced the number of ticks found on the mice, and we reduced the number of nymphs on the properties by 78 to 95 percent. So that integrated using more than one technique was quite effective. Right now we're doing a study in Guilford, Connecticut. Again, here what we're doing is we're using combinations of the bait box, the MET-52 spray, and the four poster device. The study began uh, full implementation in uh, summer of uh, last year. We repeated it this year. Uh, here you can see the sprayer that we're using, the technician there is applying the MET-52 to one of the properties. Uh, bait boxes went out uh, to other homes and we're seeing a really good results with that, but it's still early to report that. So where do we go from here? Okay. All right. We, ticks are difficult to control. Uh, number of ticks are increasing in distribution. Uh, and more and more tick-borne diseases. We have some of these tools which I talked about for killing ticks, but the big issue is we've been, it's been very hard to show an impact on disease. So that Mumford Cove is one of the few studies where we're actually able to document an impact on human disease itself. Um, how do we define and support tick methods is kind of unclear. Uh, we need safe, cost-effective and uh, uh, prevention tools, the bait box, is a good tool, but it's a little pricey, okay? So to address a lot of these issues of the increasing uh, tick-borne diseases, the issues with treatment, diagnosis, prevention, tick control, um, a charter was made by uh, uh, the Congress pact, uh, passed the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, which defined this charter on how this tick-borne disease working group was structured. And their first report from this uh, was done to Congress in 2018, uh, but the um, Tick-Borne Disease Working Group is continuing uh, to follow up with that report with additional recommendations and surveys on, on how we can manage this increasing uh, tick-borne disease crisis here 
in the United States. The current charter expires on August 10th of 2021, uh, and we're supposed to have a, a working group, a second working group uh, report to Congress uh, next, sometime next year. Okay, so I'll wrap this up uh, with this quote from an old prayer in 1856. From red bugs and bed bugs, from sand flies and land flies, mosquitoes, gallinippers and fleas, from hog ticks and dog ticks, from hen lice and men lice, we pray thee, good Lord, give us ease. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that people may have. Okay, you have wells, so the question is a spray. Now the standard, the pyrethroid insecticides are not water soluble, okay? So they're not gonna leach. Now some things leach, but the pyrethroid's leach potential is very, very low. Uh, they are extremely toxic to aquatic organisms, uh, fish and so on, because they lack the enzymes to break it down. So uh, you don't want to spray it near a stream or pond or something like that. And obviously you don't want to spray it right next to your wellhead, but it's not going to leach down to your, to your groundwater. It's, it's gonna, it binds, it's an emulsion, and it binds to the organic matter, and then sunlight microorganisms break it down eventually, uh, but it's not gonna have much of a leach potential. The fungus? Okay, the fungus will affect a few other insects. I mean, beetles mainly. Uh, they used it for some beetle pest control, uh, mainly like in potted plants and things like that. Um, but it's certainly much, you know, but most non-target effects uh, are very low to non-existent. It doesn't affect bees. It doesn't affect earthworms. It doesn't affect some uh, beneficial insects like lace wings and things like that. Uh, a lot of those had to be screened as part of the registration process. Um, so it's a much safer alternative. I got to cut the woods back around my house. I'm, I'm thinking October is probably a low tick month. And just dress up in light clothes and spray up. Spray up. I mean, the adult ticks are active. October is the peak month for adult deer tick activity. But the adults are easier to spot, certainly, than the nymphs are. Yeah. Um, they're still small, but they're not as small as a nymph. Yeah, yeah. so basically, when I'm in the field, I use the permethrin spray. I have found it extremely effective. I've had very few tick bites and surprise after 30 years. Plus, I haven't gotten Lyme disease yet. But So it, it can be quite, quite effective if it's... And where you do know, you get the permethrin? The permethrin sprays are generally at camping and sports goods stores. You're not going to find it at, at your drug stores. Yeah, actually mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't want to be on the spot here, but uh, what is the idea that the federal government is the state government the government is declaring that this is called a public health crisis, similarly that what they've done it with mosquitoes and there's multiple aspects to that. Uh, one, like I mentioned, it's a lot of the exposure, at least here in the Northeast, is primarily residential. So that kind of limits in terms of what can be done from, say, a municipality or state effort. You know, we're not going to go marching into everybody's backyard in the spring against somebody's wishes. Um, Connecticut doesn't have it, but some states do have mosquito control districts, which are funded by the county. Okay, we don't have county government here in Connecticut, so we have a you know kind of a hodgepodge of 169 towns, as you all well know. Um, so that complicates any kind of directed effort. So there, there's those wrinkles to it. But it's part of the Tick Working Group is a recognition that we need mechanisms to increase. Um, you know, our ability or coordination to attack the tick issue. The other issue is a, a primary ecological. It's, it's mosquitoes fly, it's, it's easier to do targeted treatments in their environment. Um, the ticks are basically everywhere the host animals are. Uh, and they have a more complex life cycle. So all of these issues just make it a much more difficult uh, thing to address.
Yes. What's wrong with chickens? How effective are they? Ah, the chicken guinea hen question. Okay. There's very little data uh, available on how well the chickens would work. Bear in mind, chickens are birds, and guess what ticks feed on? Birds. Okay. So, um, you know, so the ticks will feed on those animals. So I suspect it's possible if you had enough of them. And when they scratch through the leaf litter, my hypothesis is if they do have any impact, they don't actually eat the ticks. Now the ticks are so small, they're not eating them. A study was done with turkeys, too. And the tur turkeys are not eating adult ticks. But think about the size of an engorged female tick that fell off the deer down in the leaf litter. It's possible if you have enough of them, they could be scratching through the leaf litter and consume those. Uh, never been tested, so I can't really answer that question. Um, but I don't think it's going to have much of an impact. What about our native uh, moose population? seem to be uh, quite a host for ticks. They are. Now, the issue with the moose is the winter tick, Dermacinerama pectus. Uh, that tick is a one-host tick, a little different. You know, these I talk about are what we call three-host ticks. Remember, each stage has to find a, you know, feed drops off, has to find a host all over again. And most of them fail. Otherwise, we'd be knee-deep in ticks. The thing about the winter tick is that, you know, you've got in the late summer, early fall, you got thousands and thousands of larvae. The moose encounters that. The larval tick feeds on the moose, not too big a deal. Molts to a nymph, but it, it, you know, it doesn't drop off. And then it feeds and molts to an adult. So those you know, tens of thousands of larval ticks trans becomes tens of thousands of adult ticks feeding on the moose. So the moose die from, you know, from extreme irritation and blood loss. They're called ghost moose because they'll actually scrape their hide off and look white in appearance. So that in the past couple of years, there's been high mortality of moose. With the warmer winters we've had, we've just seen a lot more winter tick activity. Deer, for some reason, seem to be better at grooming themselves. They don't seem to build up the same kind of numbers on them that the moose do. Uh, any particular type of wood chip for the barrier, or just whatever you can get? <laughs> Think dry, you got to maintain it. The wood chips would break down and soon they weren't any different than leaf litter. Yeah. Uh, what we did is we basically did a little trenching. We put black plastic down, overlaid it with wood chips because that's what we could afford out of the grant to, to put down. Uh, obviously, the better the quality of the wood chips, uh, the drier and the better the substrate. You know, would be. It's also a good psychological barrier that you know it's kind of like a line here is where you're you're passing into the tick zone, as it were. It works better when you got a real clear cut margin between your dense woods and yeah. yard. Obviously, not quite as effective if you've got more of an ecological transition there between the, you know, on the property. I got a question. Oh. Just the clothing. Permethrin is an insecticide. You do not want to put it directly on your skin. And one other question was, um, Lyme disease, and there's a study going on by the government right now whether it was created as a, um, during World War II. I don't buy that. I think, you know, that, but I know what book you're talking about. I've read it. And, you know, personally, I think that there was some guilt because he was involved with a lot of, you know, warfare efforts to use looking at insects as a, you know, for transmitting uh, certain pathogens. Borrelia is not a good candidate for something like that. And um, if you really think about it, we, what we think happened is, is we probably, Native Americans probably had it. So we know ticks were very abundant back in the 1700s. A Swedish naturalist named Pierre Kalm came through, kept a diary of his travels. It's actually a fascinating book. But in there, he noted several times how bad the ticks were. In the late 1800s, a state entomologist in New York named Asa Finch said you couldn't find any ticks. What happened between 1750 and the mid-1800s? Cut all the trees down. They cut all the trees down. What else? How many deer do you think they were here in Connecticut in 1896? Twelve. Twelve deer. No habitat, no hosts, no ticks. 
We do know they survived on parts of Long Island, islands off the Cape where the deer were not hunted out. You want to know what the oldest known human case of Lyme disease is? Jesus? <laughs> Actually, you've got to go back further than that. No, okay, let's, let's try Holy over, let's try over 5,000 years ago. Yeah, Iceman. Iceman. Oh, yeah. He was so well preserved, remember they were doing all that DNA work up on him, they know the color of his eyes, they know the components of all the various parts of the clothing that he was wearing, they know what his meal was before he was killed. They found evidence that he was infected with lime spark beads, oh, wow. DNA. So, you know. And, and last year, I trapped all the chipmunks around my house because there were so many. This year, I had none until just the last couple of weeks. They all of a sudden seemed to show up in mass. Uh, I, what? Okay, so basically, I mean, uh, yeah, so the chipmunks and mice, the reproduction, they're going to they're gonna cycle through the summer. So you think about it, and they come out, you have a few winter uh, individuals in the early spring, yeah. and they're going to have litters. Yeah. So, you have, you. so you're going to have several litters, okay? And then what are we having right now, too? Acorns. 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 I'm expecting a bumper crop of chipmunks in my yard next year. Um, I'm seeing a few now, uh, not many, but two, yeah, last year and the year before, I had a lot of chipmunks in I, my I yard. I got 26 last year. Yeah. So, um, so it's a it's a boom and bust cycle depending on the food resources, obviously. Okay. No, the chipmunks do not collect the cotton out of the, the tick tubes. So how do you get rid of how do you determine that? Ah, there really isn't a good way to do that. There is <laughs> there really isn't a good way to do that. There is a secondary reservoir, the white-footed mouse is the main one, but chipmunk shrews. Shrews kind of, you know, also can infect ticks that feed on them. Uh, no, not so much rabbits. Um, you heard stories about possums and squirrels. Ticks get on them too. They're a little better at grooming themselves, that's all. They're not going to eliminate or remove all the ticks from your property. They'll pick up some. Birds, some birds can infect ticks. A lot of birds cannot. It's not a blanket thing. It depends on the bird species. So robins can infect ticks, gray cat birds can't. Okay, wood thrushes don't, Carolina wrens can't. Um, so it's, it's not an absolute thing, you know, but like I said, you know, birds do carry a lot of, a lot of ticks. They're also bring, you know, like you'll get Lone Star ticks, they're not established up in Maine, for example, but in Canada, you know, they're not up there, but you'll, people will encounter them occasionally, they're brought north on migrating birds. Yes? I was going to say, what about raccoons, bears, bobcats? Ticks feed on them too. Raccoons and bobcats and all that. Remember, our black-legged tick and used to be known up in the upper Midwest, Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, all that, is the bear tick. And what if you have animals rabies and that's fit? Hmm? Uh, like, can like a tick transmit rabies? Like no. It? Tick cannot transmit rabies. And remember, not every tick can transmit every single pathogen. These particular diseases are associated with certain ticks for a reason, because they've evolved with that tick and with the animal that that tick feeds on. So for example, Lone Star ticks cannot transmit Lyme disease. It's not adapted to that tick. The American dog tick cannot transmit Lyme disease. But it's a vector for Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. Fortunately, we haven't had any cases of those diseases documented here in this state for, I don't know, over a couple of decades or more. Um, but, you know, so there, that's why each tick species will have its own uh, set of disease pathogens that are associated with it. Because remember, when the tick feeding picks it up, that, organ, that uh, pathogen has to survive that molt to the next stage and then be available to be transmitted. Any other questions? How are we doing? You had uh, mentioned about an hour transmission time, I think, right, for uh, Borrelia. And then you said the stock of Colossum was kind of the exception at maybe 15 minutes. But do you have, is there reliable information about 
<coughs> yeah, okay, so remember it's 24 hours to 36 hours for Lyme. It's 24 hours roughly for Babesian anaplasmosis as well, sometimes a little shorter than that, but again, it's not immediate, okay? So that's why, again, those daily tick checks are really important. The Powassan virus is an exception. Now, the thing about Powassan, Powassan is an encephalitis virus. It has about a 10 to 15 percent fatality rate. It's related to West Nile virus. Um, and it's probably, we don't, really don't know how many people get infected by Powassan virus and don't have symptoms or have very mild symptoms. We just don't know that. But I suspect it's very similar to West Nile in that case because West Nile virus, a lot of people get exposed. They don't get ill or they, you know, maybe very mild illness, don't think anything about it. But obviously it's very severe for those that, you know, develop the neuroinvasive uh, form of West Nile virus. Same thing probably with Powassan. And those that do survive exposure to the Powassan virus often will have severe uh, neurologic or other consequences that don't go away afterwards. So it's, it's a severe virus as well. Recently, a man died from that. Yes. Like I said, it's, it'll, it's got about a 10% or so fatality rate. Okay, okay so, so say you get bit by a tick, you need to go somewhere and get some antibiotics? Okay, so, yeah, so the, you're asking, is it worth prophylactically treating just on tick bite? Okay. Most physicians won't. I mean, think about it, you have about a 50-50 chance, roughly, on average, of whether that tick is infected or not. So, and, and if you remove it soon enough... It's only 5%. Huh? At the doctor's office, they said 5%. I had to go to a walk-in clinic to get one. Okay, so bear in mind that 5% comes from a study that was done a long time ago looking at prophylactic treatment. So between how soon somebody finds the tick combined with the actual infection rate in the tick, they found that the probability of getting Lyme from any one tick bite was roughly around 5%. And of course, if that's the right tick, it will nail you. He also found that a single treatment, a single dose of doxycycline, it's in my handbook, given within 72 hours of the tick bite would abort the infection, as opposed to going on a full 14 or whatever so day course. Perfect. Definitely. That's a, yeah, it's a judgment call. I mean, I yeah. can't make that for you. It's a call. So, in following up with your question, it seems like physicians, in terms of reporting, understanding, and knowing what to do, are not as aware as they should be about the potential risk of They well, yeah, so you did, all right, so yeah, so Lyme literate has a number of connotations. I mean, I know there's physicians that are so-called Lyme literate, and I have some issues with some of them, uh, in part. Uh, but a lot of doctors are not familiar with some of the peculiarities that have to do with that, even know how to properly read a Western blot. Um, testing too soon, as I mentioned to you, exactly when it isn't going to tell you anything, and then basing their diagnosis on that. There's an over-reliance on the testing. Uh, particularly in the early stages. Now, later manifestations, most people, of course, will eventually develop an antibody titer that will more readily show up on the test. It's still not 100%. You're still looking at, oh, maybe a 50% failure rate, perhaps. Um, but again, it's much more reliable when you get into the later stages uh, of the disease. That, if you... I would suggest, if, really, if you really want to kind of interesting, know that little thing I showed you, look it up online. If, go ahead and read the working group report to Congress, the 2018 working group, which basically was condensed down. It's really an abstract of the more comprehensive reports that were written by the various subcommittees. Because, you know, they wanted something. They even thought it was still too long because how, how much, how long is some Congress going to read, you know, a document? Um, but it hits the highlight issues related to diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Okay? And I think you'll find it a bit of an eye opener in some regards. So yeah, I would. You yeah, well, and Dr. Not too, but I would, you know, so go ahead and look it up. It's, it's freely available online. Would you mind repeating the, the, the question about the tick bite and the single dose? 
Okay, so basically, I think it was a 200 milligram dose given prophylactically within 72 hours of the tick bite would prevent infection, okay? He did look in the study beyond 72 hours. That's why that, it's nothing magical about that 72 mark other than the fact that that's as, as long as the follow-up in the study was done. Okay, any other questions? I've got one. You've got a number of uh, larger holes animals like deer, bear, and coyotes, bobcats, get bitten by ticks, they carry ticks. Do they ever have symptoms of Lyme disease? No. They don't. They don't. But well, why do dogs get it versus these wild animals? Dogs, well, the wild animals have been have a long history of exposure. They're kind of adapted to it. Deer, actually, the complement arm, I'll we'll get into it, part of their immune system is actually anti-abdorealcidal. So deer will develop antibodies. You can serologically test deer for exposure to Lyme disease. But uh, they actually wipe out the infection, which is why they're not reservoir hosts. Okay, but yeah, they don't they don't get ill. But yeah, dogs do. So for dogs, you have a variety of you know tick anti tick agents that you can get from your vet for your dog, and there's also can several different canine uh, Lyme vaccines that are available for dogs. So getting back to a human Lyme disease vaccine, there isn't one currently. Uh, uh, GlaxoSmithKline had one uh, that was pulled from the market in 2002. It was mainly a marketing decision because they weren't selling enough of it because of allegations that the vaccine was causing problems, which were never supported. Uh, but there's another company now that's starting phase two trials for a new uh, Lyme disease vaccine. We'll see how that progresses. Okay. Is there any data about the, about the effectiveness of Lyme? Vaccines for pets, for dogs. Are they, is there data out there that shows that it is effective? Yeah, so the Lyme vaccines for dogs are actually really quite effective. I mean, they're not 100%. The thing to bear in mind with dogs, I mean, any dog that's outdoors is going to pick up ticks and get exposed. That's just the way it is, okay? So, um, but only about 5% or so of those dogs will develop clinical Lyme, even without any protection. But those dogs that do get sick can get quite ill. And then there's a manifestation that occurs only in dogs, fortunately not us, uh, it's renal failure. And if that develops, you get Lyme renal failure in your dog, your vet can't save your dog. So. Are there any animals besides dogs that become clinically symptomatic? Is there, pardon? Are, are there any animals other than Uh, occasionally, there's been some, but not much. A little bit in cats. Cats really don't get clinically ill that much. Cattle on occasion, horses on occasion, but again, um, not. It hasn't been a huge issue in those animals. Can a cat get Lyme disease? Uh, the cats get infected, but most of them actually don't develop, you know, really uh, acute disease. But it can happen. It just that most, you know, generally don't. Can they spread the disease if they're infected? No. The only way you can get it is through a tick bite. Oh. But obviously, a dog or cat can bring ticks into the house and expose you to ticks. So, all right, I think what we'll do is we'll stop right now. And But if you have additional questions, I'll stick around for a few minutes uh, for, for follow up. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Stafford, for such an enlightening and informative presentation. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to uh, let everyone know uh, that we have T-shirts, uh, calendars, note cards, and uh, yeah, that's it <laughs> for sale. Uh, the new uh, calendars are out with the, with the cards. And I want to thank Carol Vincent and her daughter Tracy, uh, the graphic designer, for working on that project for us. Uh, so uh, we have refreshments. Please uh, join us out in the lobby. And our next event won't be until December 10th. We'll be at the Canton Flatbreads Pizza Shop. And if you're looking for some pizza, come down and see us. And uh, they can give us a donation for every pizza they sell, whether you take it out or eat in. So we're we'll looking forward to seeing you there. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. This is most questions I think uh, that have never been asked any presenter we've had. I can see that 
was so informative and your interest, and, you know, it's something that we're all interested in. So. I do have a couple of flyers over here, one's on the deer tick and one's on the lone star tick on the diseases associated with them, if you want to pick them up before you leave. Thank you.